So what we're going to be looking at today is uh, exhibitions and sort of what is involved in those. And we have three wonderful panelists uh, joining us today. We have Melissa Cole from the Oshawa Museum. Uh, we have Merve um, from Blue Rhino Design. And we have Georgiana Sanchu from the Royal Canadian Regent Museum. And we're going to begin today actually with um, a short video. Um, all of our panelists have produced a small video to share uh, with you to sort of introduce themselves and sort of what they do. So we're going to begin with this. Hi, my name is Melissa Cole, and I'm the curator at the Oshawa Museum. I have been fortunate to spend the last 20 years of my career here at the Oshawa Museum, which is also located within my hometown. And that also makes it another reason why it is so special to me to have been able to spend um, a good portion of my career here so far. I did start here at the museum in 2000 as an intern after graduating from Thumbling College's program, uh, Museum Management and Curatorship. I also have a degree from Trent University in Anthropology. And I always wondered what I was going to do with that Anthropology degree and where it was going to take me. And that's when I discovered that Fleming College had this amazing um, Museum Studies program. My job is definitely incredibly varied. Um, for instance, uh, this morning after checking email, um, I spent the morning looking for newspapers from the 1890s, um, seeking out an ad that was related to a bread basket that I had on display in the exhibit that I'm actually currently standing in. My afternoon um, will be spent installing graphic panels for that same exhibit. Uh, tomorrow I actually have an appointment with a member from our museum community. Rather than have her come down, um, especially during COVID, rather than her come down to the museum, um, I've made an appointment with her to come visit her at her home. And uh, of course I will be wearing a mask when I go to visit her, but to see about um, this beautiful wedding dress. Um, she has already sent along some photographs, but I still would like to view it in person before we accept it into the collection. It's a wedding dress from the 1930s. Um, she has an image of the dress, she has uh, of the woman wearing it, um, as well as the church that they were married in. Um, the gentleman that was the groom was also a principal at a local school, so there's just so much rich, rich history attached to this one item um, that will hopefully be coming in and making its way into our collection. Um, and lastly, I've got to show off and brag about uh, the students that I have working with right now it's another aspect of my job is being able to engage with students and give back to them what I have learned through my years and my career and for instance this beautiful sign wall behind me was designed by our students Mia and Dylan and it was also installed by them as well. Um, Dylan is actually a graduate of Fleming College's uh, Museum Management and Curatorship so he's actually doing his in internship with us this fall. In my role as curator at a small institution, I spend a lot of time managing, researching, exhibiting, and talking about the museum's collection. A lot of this material is now shared online through podcasts, blogs, articles, and on-site through exhibitions. One of the best things about working at the Oshawa Museum is working with the collection, and I'm always inspired by the challenge of developing new and unique ways of telling stories using these collections and exhibitions. When developing an exhibit, it's important, especially at a community museum, that we include our community's voice within these exhibits by reaching out to people and our community in innovative ways. I like to call these exhibits community curated. For example, when our community celebrated 90 years as a city, we reached out to our community for memories and artifacts reflecting on their lives in Oshawa, which resulted in an exhibition called Reflections of Oshawa, celebrating 90 years as a city. Besides the education requirements to work in museums, to get a job as a curator, you need to be interested in objects, research, and interested in history and inquiring about what objects can tell us about the past and present. And you should be able to work in a variety of areas and enjoy practical work because a lot of curatorial jobs are quite practical. You'll enjoy a balance of research, writing, and a more practical tasks such as exhibition work. It really is a fantastic job. I guess I'd have to say that after spending 20 years of my career in it. Because it is so varied and you get to meet so many different kinds of people. If you're interested in curatorial or exhibition work, you definitely need to be open-minded, as you can about things that might help you along the way. Whether it's trying different internships, volunteering at museums, or stepping outside a job that might be outside of your comfort zone. Remember, you might not get into a curatorial role right away, and it may take a few different jobs to get there, but once you're there, it's worth the effort. 
I'm uh, Dr. Georgiana Stanchu, Curator, Executive Director at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum in London, Ontario. I have been uh, a museum curator uh, since my mid-twenties and uh, worked in several museums uh, in Europe and North America. I have participated in many exhibition projects, collections management projects and uh, public programming uh, in museums. But today I chose to talk to you about uh, exhibition development. So an exhibition in a museum is uh, looking good and uh, people enjoy that. But before uh, reaching that stage, there is a lot of work behind. And I will uh, just uh, say that an exhibition is a, uh, a story with objects. It, it is a circular process that starts with an idea. Then uh, for the, to illustrate that idea, a curator makes uh, a selection of objects and I'm going to call them telling art objects. Then uh, uh, the curator has to do the research around those objects and build a storyline. And you see behind me here, there are many storylines. The write up, it's a uh, storyline. So, as I said, uh, uh, exhibition development is a uh, circular process and uh, uh, during this process what we do, we write a book technically that uh, people are not reading sitting uh, in an armchair comfortably at home, uh, they are just uh, reading, uh, uh, walking around a gallery. Uh, and uh, that book uh, includes uh, real objects and uh, uh, real images. Some of the images is a little tricky to work with because uh, they need to be converted to other format than the original one for the people to understand what's happening. And this is what we have done uh, when we developed the First World War uh, exhibit uh, at the um, Royal Canadian Regiment Museum. You can see here a selection of artifacts and plenty of photographs that we have uh, uh, oversized, we enlarged a lot for them to be visible and uh, relevant to the visitors so they understand what we want to say. All right, so I'm going to show you, uh, first of all, the photographs that we have used to uh, build our uh, exhibition. There is this one here that was uh, taken in Cheriton in 1915 in England, and uh, we have used it for our uh, storyboard. Uh, you can see this image of the regiment, uh, the Royal Canadian Regiment in 1915 in Bermuda. It has been used as a backdrop for the storyline at the beginning of the First World War section of our permanent display. Uh, you can see how big this book is and how difficult it is to uh, manipulate the photographs. These photographs are very unique, it's important to preserve them, that's why we do not allow the public to manipulate them. And uh, by the same token, we want the public to see them. So uh, we have found with uh, experts in graphic design and communications, we have found solutions uh, to make them visible to the public. Uh, so we walked around a little bit in the uh, First World War um, exhibition of the Permanent Gallery. It's the end of the exhibition and this is where we uh, uh, finish our story uh, about the First World War. I'm going to say thank you for uh, watching this uh, panel. Also, I'm encouraging you to look up at home uh, photographs of your childhood and even objects that you have and try to do a, a small exhibit. Uh, you can show it to your family. They will be happy to see it. You can also use uh, digital uh, media, uh, meaning uh, you can do a PowerPoint and uh, that will count as a uh, digital exhibition. Hello everyone, I'm Merve. I'm an exhibition designer working in a company called Blue Rhino Design. Blue Rhino Design is a design company uh, located in Toronto. Today I want you to 
talk about how I ended up being an exhibition designer because it is not a profession that you go study for your bachelor's. So what I did was I first studied interior architecture and environmental design. And during my studies, I took a course called curatorial design. This was my first trigger for the exhibit. And later on, I continued to my master's concentrating more about the exhibit in within spaces to convert into a different function, scenography of theaters, those kind of fields. And then when I finished with my studies, I started working in the um, museum design and like these kind of narrative architectures in a design company. So what we did was we created narrative architectures for museums, exhibitions, heritage centers, science centers, visitor centers, children's museums, or some compelling trade fairs. So what we did was we create interactive exhibits and immersive spaces that communicate through experience. And what our role was to encourage conversation and make complex topics accessible by putting the visitor first in every design. So it's the exhibition design is quite interesting because everyone is coming from different backgrounds. You have to work with scientists, you have to work with archaeologists, and each and every project, the topic changes. And when the topic changes, you have to adapt to that. And then you have to change your plan according to that. So you, a bit like you have to be the architect, you have to be the engineer. So you have to use, it's quite, it's quite diverse and continues to changing. Actually, that's why I like about being an exhibit designer because e with each and every project you learn new things. Additionally, I thought it's a good idea to sum up the visuals of the works that we did. Um, this is an energy museum located in an old industrial site. And this is another science center that we worked on the design of the laboratories. And this is another visitor center that we worked in an archaeological site where we worked on the brand identity, signage of the site, and then the visitor, self, visitor center itself. Another history museum, ethnography museum, where we deal with a lot with the artifacts, how to show them neatly, how to preserve them. This is another trade show idea, boot idea for a tile company. This is a, again for the same tile company. We did a small installation in Bologna, Italy, that we tell the story of an architect. This is a temporary exhibit about a diaspora story. So, or these kind of like small stories in trade shows that were in this one itself. It's a space system company that we talk, we created this small hub for the satellites. This is a seed company. Again, we created a story and then everything, colors go with it, the story goes with it, there's a story going on. But the content is really during the style of the work, more or less. This is what I do. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Hopefully that was a good introduction for everyone about what everyone, all of our presenters have been doing and their different um, experiences. Um, I'm just going to let anyone, all of them, give us a second to uh, introduce themselves again and just if there's anything else they wanted to add. Um, we can start with Melissa. I don't, I'm, I'm Melissa Cole and I'm the curator at the Oshawa Museum and a portion of my job is um, related to exhibition work. Uh, quite a bit of my, I'm going to say probably about 50, at least 50% of my job, we get, we're constantly changing our exhibits on site. So um, I have been fortunate to work, work with uh, exhibit designers such as uh, Merve. Um, and I really enjoy that because I learn a lot from um, working with designers myself because it's not my first, it's not necessarily my only role uh, that, I, that I play at the museum. And also I do instruct in the Fleming College program as well. I teach an exhibition design um, course there as well. So I've kind of done a full circle with my career and it's great to be able to give back uh, to others. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Rebecca. <clears throat> 
teacher. I am Millicent Georgiana Gray. You had the advantage of having a sp actual museum space. We, in the pandemic, we were stuck in, in our homes all the time. I felt weird like talking to a webcam. He said you had this like great face and artifacts, so jealous about these great videos, thank you. So what we do, I work in a design company, but we, usually we start to work with the content. For example, right now we are working for a science center about an Arctic museum. So. It's been almost like a year. We are still working on the content and we slowly started to do the design stuff. So first of all, you should understand what you're telling, who are your visitors, what's the key message that you wanna give, what is the story behind it? Sometimes we meet with the communities, like real people just to learn what should we tell in a museum? So that process takes a long time because usually when I say, I'm an exhibition designer. People start to ask about the graphics, how do I use the program, but it's mostly the content that I spend time with so that I learn the content, understand the content, and I, I know what to tell. And then the last process is the design where we put all the information together and put it in a physical space. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Georgiana? So I'm um, Georgiana Stanchu. I'm the curator executive director here at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum. And uh, as mentioned in the video, I have a uh, long uh, career in museums that spans over uh, 25 years, close to 30 now. Um, and I have worked in uh, museums um, in Europe and North America. Uh, also, I have a, um, a large spectrum of uh, museum work. I was initially a, uh, uh, a fine art uh, museum uh, curator, more precisely uh, old masters uh, European uh, paintings. And uh, well, uh, now lately I'm working in military museums. I did work in an Air Force museum. I am now working in an Army museum and uh, those are very different uh, things. Uh, so um, that's my story. I'm very happy that you joined and thank you to the other panelists to join us. Wonderful. So I'm going to start heading right into <laughs> the questions that were um, pre-submitted uh, when people registered. Um, we've got a really, have some really interesting ones. Uh, one of the first ones, um, what was your favorite exhibit to create um, and why is that? And how did you go about creating that exhibit? Um, do you want to start with uh, Merve? Sure. I think my favorite exhibit was, an, was in an archaeological site for the visitor center. It, the site is called Göbekli Tepe in English. It's up Belly Hill, I think. It's located in Turkey and it's 12,000 years old late. So it's like the most ancient thing that humankind made, like even like 6,000 years older than Stone Edge. So like before the pyramid, everything, like it's in the pre-pottery Neolithic side. So practically it was my favorite because we had no information. There was a site there was some findings, but we had nothing. And then we had to build a visitor center out of it. And then there was one um, German archeolog archeologist, Klaus Schmidt, and then he had one book and which he wrote to by his findings. And he had some guests, guesses, like he thought that there were hunter gatherers, but also there were some like, um, pictures or like findings of farm animals, wild farm animals, wild, wild barley. So he thought like they were doing also some architecture, but like there were all these like small information that we had, but we had to build a visitor center so people understand what was the age was. So what we did is we tried to create a, this immersive space and then the visitors were really different. So there were going to be some children. So we made a small like archaeology game kind of a thing so that they understand what archaeology is. Or there were some like T-shaped pillars in the archaeological site. They were almost 50 
15 feet high in a very high mount on a mountain peak. And then we, no one really understands even today how the people managed to carry this tip people almost like stone age, you can Im image that in your mind, like huge rock, rock standing. So people didn't really understand the scale of it and the engineering of it. So we did a replica of this T-shaped pillar so that children could like compare themselves with the T-pillar shape so that how huge they are. And then also we did a 30 meter long immersive like video projection space and then we did a scene of how these like cults were living or like their understanding of lifestyle we did a small video and then so that the visitor at least get a sense of what was the age like and then also we put some like we, we used the as an artifact what we had was the journals of the archaeologists so we used those like there were some pictures taken we used those for storytelling those kind of stuff so it was really challenging because we had no artifact no information at all but at the end the very end experience was really nice i think we, we are preparing them into the site so that they know what to expect they know what was the era like so i think that was my favorite Exhibit because it that, was quite challenging. That sounds like quite an incredible um, adventure to deal with such a site with so little backing to be able to deal with it. Um, Georgiana, did you have uh, one of your favorites? It's kind of hard to, to choose, but I think uh, um, I have an example that is suitable for this, uh, uh, for this setting now. Um, in uh, my first exhibition, I had to do when I uh, took the position here at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum uh, in London. Uh, we were uh, uh, reopening the permanent gallery and uh, there was one uh, piece that was added, one uh, portion in the storyline, and that is Militia and Reserve Heritage of the Royal Canadian Regiment. And that spans over 150 years of history, uh, so close to 180. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of space. And uh, I like to refer to that uh, exhibit as the, uh, the exhibition that uh, condensed 150 years of history in 1.5 uh, square meters. That is uh, roughly four feet, four or five feet uh, square, uh, so it was uh, it was uh, challenging, but it was also rewarding. And the most important um, uh, aspect from that experience was um, uh, the working in a team, working with uh, the team members. And uh, one of the team members was uh, Blue Rhino. Uh, Merve was not there, but um, it's with them that we sort out, sorted out how we are going to uh, communicate this whole history of 150 years in 150 centimeters, uh, square, square centimeters. So uh, that was on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, research partners, knowledgeable individuals who were um, uh, able to mentor me through the most important aspects of these 150 years of history. Awesome. So yeah, that, that's, that's my example. Awesome, thank you, Georgiana. That's it. As I, I, I am at the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum myself, it is quite an impressive amount of history we've condensed into quite a, quite a small space. Um, Melissa, uh, what, do you have an example you'd like to share? So with our site, um, I work at a local history museum and our site's comprised of, which I did not talk about in our introduction, I, in my introduction, I wish I had uh, three historic homes. And I did mention that we are continually changing our display space, which is located in one of the homes called Robinson House. What's unique about the exhibit I'm going to talk about is it was about Victorian mourning, but we were able to basically connect the house, which is Henry House, uh, set up like a Victorian home and actually incorporate it into the exhibit that was over in Robinson House. Um, with a unique theme. We've actually done this theme twice. Um, 
Uh, we did it on a much smaller scale in 2005 and then expanded the exhibit to Robinson House in 2015 by incorporating a lot of other local stories as well and businesses. Um, so the, the title itself says most likely what it is. It was 19th, looking at 19th century um, funeral and death customs. Um, it is a bit of a, a morbid topic, um, but it was probably one of our most popular exhibits that we ever created in-house. Um, this is before, um, this is 2015, I've done many exhibits since that have just been as popular, but this theme alone was really catchy. But what was interesting about it was all the people that were involved in it and the research behind it um, as well. Using the house, uh, Thomas Henry, um, when he passed away, there was funeral notices about it and the cemetery that he is buried in is located within 10 minutes, a 10 minute walk, a 10 minute walk from, from the actual home. So all the programming and everything that was centered around, it was a, quite a team effort. Uh, of course, we partnered with local funeral homes, um, one of which loaned us a hearse to be used in the display as well. Um, and the other unique thing that a lot of people don't realize is just how funerals kind of um, came about in our community. And one of the original funeral homes is still in business today, but it was actually a furniture maker. So bringing in um, the idea that furniture makers were also the ones that were be making coffins and such. So there's a lot of interesting stories that got brought in and then a lot of community partners and support as well. And that's what made this, this exhibit unique for us and that it continued a lot of community exhibits from then. And that's really all I do now is most of my exhibits always involve um, a community aspect, um, whether it's through oral history, um, something along those lines or partnerships so it's every there's not any exhibit that we ever do now that doesn't involve the community in some way we are a local history museum so we're very different than um, some other larger institutions so the community aspect is very important for us and why was this exhibit so popular the only other exhibit that was really popular that brought in um, people outside our general audience was one called sitting pretty and it was about the history of the toilet um, we did not create it we brought it in and the, I think the main reasons why they were so popular for a small site like us was because they're so relatable, um, the topics themselves. It's, uh, so they were a lot of fun to work on as well and um, some serious sides. And, and we actually continued to dress Henry House for mourning, but um, I have to be honest, this year we didn't. And we felt, we thought it might still bring people in, but we thought with COVID and everything else going on, we just thought it wasn't the right time. For that topic so um that has yeah. the one great thing is that it has led to future um uh, events that we do but uh just a lot it's just a unique exhibit too thank you um yeah that is um, i remember seeing it it is was quite a quite a new <laughs> unique exhibit in 2015. <laughs> um so if we want to continue on and this is sort of an interesting question it's sort of a, a two-part um because it's actually largely impacted by uh covid is I would, I would have to split it to so it's thinking pre March 2020. Um, do you prefer sort of doing interactive exhibits or ones that are more hands free um, and why and then we'll talk about sort of the changes we've had to to had to um, address. Um, does, do you want to start Georgiana. So, uh, yes, sure. Uh, it's difficult to say I mean. Uh, do I prefer interactive exhibits? I think I prefer the method that's suitable for the topic of the exhibit, for the content of the exhibit. Some are better with a lot of interactivity and it can be hands-on or digital. Uh, others are better uh, without any interaction whatsoever. So for example, uh, a fine art exhibition uh, let's say classic uh, paintings and this kind of things. Uh, you don't have to touch those, but they are beautiful only to look at. So that that's no interactivity whatsoever. You can bring some digital interaction uh, around them, but you will never touch the artifact. Uh, in uh, in a setting such as uh, this one right now in the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum, and I think in many uh, community museums, you may have a topic that is pertinent to some try on elements. For example, we have, and that is very popular uh, in the communication section of our gallery, we have a um, um, Morse code uh, device that is very popular with people. So that is interactive. There are other type of interactivity 
for example, um, you have an activity that uh, you offer the visitor, and I don't know whether they try on a, a piece of um, a costume and take a picture and then they uh, put it on Facebook, uh, or they reply questions. So uh, to go back to before and after COVID, uh, I can say that uh, after COVID has created a lot of problems with uh, removing everything that was interactive because we had to we have to prepare for uh, hands free, no touching. So um, yeah, that 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 was the challenge. Now uh, uh, the um, alternate solution for us in order to continue uh, engaging our community was to uh, engage digitally, and for that purpose alone, uh, both um, the moderator Sarah and myself have acquired a tremendous amount of uh, digital skills or video production, more than we ever wanted. <laughs> so yes. we kind of adapt. <laughs> yes, we did. Have, we are collecting up some new skill sets, and I will uh, just point out: so the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum is actually still fully closed, so we actually haven't had to um, haven't had any visitors in since uh, March uh, 2020. Um, but uh, Melissa, um, what do you, how do you feel about interactives versus hands-free? Well, you, you've worked at our, you've been fortunate to work at our site. So we don't have an, I, I will be honest, we don't have an, I, we don't have great IT support except for our server and computers. So working at a site of my size, um, we're small to medium-sized museum. And because we have very little IT support and in order for us to really keep up inter, like, I'm talking about high-end like digital interactive exhibits, like really well done ones. Um, when I first started at the museum, we had these great touchscreen um, interactives. And this was back in 2000, 99, 2000. And for a museum of our size, that was a big deal to have these touch screens. I'll be honest, I think they worked for about six months um, and they weren't, they were hard to keep up. Uh, they were really cool though, but so if they're, if we're able to maintain yeah. them, I love them. But um, for us, they, they don't work well. We have to work with a, a design team such as Merve, like Merve, like an organization like that to really ensure that um, we have the support in order to keep something like that going. And, and that's a budget issue for us as well. But we have been fortunate to work with a design team for our Indigenous gallery. And we have a few interactives in that exhibit, a low end that are easy for our site to maintain. Um, in terms of COVID, so in that same gallery, we're just gonna, we've just started to open up Robinson House and we had it closed because of the interactives. Um, we have like a, a um, area, um, like a smelling station for the, the um, for scents and then just like a, a touch button. The touch button's not too bad to wipe, but um, other ones we've had to take off because they're literally handing, like holding on to them. And um, so it's a little disappointing, but um, so yeah, going forward, some of our, we don't have interactives in any new spaces that we've opened. Even ones that we write with paper, we didn't, we even took those off. Like comment sheets and stuff like that have been removed. So it's um, kind of going through at your own leisure. We also provided like uh, guided tours, which you've, we've even stopped. So we've actually created in terms of interactive, we've created a, um, like a podcast type, um, podcast type tour that you can go through the site. And we've actually created some little elements within that for children to do like a, 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 a kind of like a, a, a spy, like a I find type thing for the museum. And uh, through that, but in terms of interactives, yeah, they've, it's changed a lot for sites. I don't know if anyone's visited larger institutions or institutions such as yourselves that those, those stations are all closed down right now. So it's, and they're fun. They really make, they can also create some great memorable experiences as well, especially for children. It, it, it's true. I was just going to mention, I remember sometime in summer, uh, the only time that um, museum, uh, museum, the word museum was mentioned in the guidelines for reopening and um, preventing the spread of COVID was when they said museum um, interactives hands-on can be reopened. Yeah, but right now they're they're closed again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
So it's, yeah, it's a good situation a lot of us are facing. Merve, um, from your experience, um, do you enjoy when you're developing ones with more interactive or do you prefer more the hands-free and changes to the way you're approaching things right now? Yeah, I can start with the COVID aspect because in these days we are dealing a lot with these, like with the solutions that we might have. One thing is we started thinking a lot because some museums, like let's say we were working on our children's museum in Saskatchewan it was a museum about architecture, agriculture. And then of course the children's, it was a hands-on hands -on exhibition like that one in particular because you work with children. So we started thinking about the materiality of the things, like things that you can clean, like let's say 50 times a day and then still the material is going to be durable enough for the all these like sprays that you put on. Or if we try to make like less digital interactions as possible, but still we have to have some. So we started experimenting. Now there are these like sensor-based interactive screen so it's not touch based but it's more like it's reading your hand yeah, cool. like you do some stuff but then you, there is this financial part, part yeah. Really yeah. so we, we have we have a budget so that we said like instead of having five interactive touch skin now we're gonna have one big one but it's going to be sensor based so these kind of challenges are coming, but we are trying to find new solutions like the materiality and technology behind it. But it's quite hard. And one other thing, like you said, like both of you said, it's the maintenance part is quite important because sometimes when you go with the digital like interactives, they get dated so fast and then you don't know if the museum can support to change it. it it every once in let's say two years, five years, you have to think about that as well, so that it's realistic. Otherwise, it's like a um, few days ago we went to see a museum in Signal Hill. They are planning to change an exhibit hall, and then there are these dead screens in the in the exhibit. They got dated so fast in seven years, you can't really use them. So you a bit like you have to be really wise, thinking maybe showing the artifact in a very smart way is much better solution than having a super technological touch screen interactive. So it, it really depends on the experience that you're looking and it really depends with what kind of a size you are working, what is the budget for it to, to be realistic is quite important. Sometimes you can combine both. For example, we are working again on an arctic museum where we have the we, we work with the indigenous communities and then we figured out that drums is one thing that is common culturally combining all of the indigenous communities so we have this we are going to have these drums as artifacts but people are not going to be able to touch them because it's probably going to create too much cacophony everyone drumming in an exhibit halls but we are going to have some station which will they're gonna see the artifacts, but probably we are hoping that it's gonna trigger the wish to try and drum. And then there will be one station with the hands on more like a digital thing that they can experience by their own. So we are gonna show the artifact, but then at one point we are gonna make a small simulation of a drum kind of a thing. So you can always experience, experience with different things. I think there's no choice one or other. That's, yeah, that's a very good point. The fact that you can um, balance them out. We did have one comment from one of um, our participants saying that, that they work at a small house museum with Barnes and they actually do a lot of work um, with tablets as well, similar to what Melissa was talking about. Um, and just to add on what everyone's saying, like when we, we were considering how to change some of ours, we're playing with like QR codes and like yeah, but foot button press someone, um, actually it was Grace who's helping us here mention the idea of things that you can press with your foot instead of touching with your hands. So there, people are coming, looking to come up with creative ideas around it, but with most of us being closed or limited access right now and budget limitations, there's not a lot of, there's limitations on what we can move forward on. Yeah, like you said, the QR is simple technology, like QR codes, we are working on those a lot because you can use your own device that mm -hmm. is um, that's another layer so 
Exactly. Yeah, that works out well. But we're we're doing moving through our time really quickly. So I'm just gonna keep us. Um... There is a, there is one other aspect about interactivity. Interactivity is a mean is a mean to achieve a goal. It's not a purpose in and in itself. So as everyone else uh, expressed here in this panel, uh, as long as it serves uh, your purpose, interactivity is good before or after COVID, that doesn't matter. You will find solutions to adapt. Yeah. You, we will always adapt. That <laughs> is what we have learned in the last eight months. <laughs> um, yeah. We have... Uh, one, we had a question actually, which is uh, quite a bit different actually, we're just going to shift gears a little bit on this, but is there a field of study that is required to get into exhibit design or are there different routes that you can take to arrive where you are? Um, do you want to start with Melissa since she teaches it at Fleming? I know. I, uh, well, the route, I, I can give you an example of my route. I think we all came to exhibit design very differently. Um, I, even hearing the panel, our roles are all very different. So uh, my route was through... Um, uh, through a degree after Trenton University, I graduated with a BA in anthropology, and I took um, the Fleming College Program Museum Management and Curatorship. It's not the only program that uh, offers museum studies type programs. There's U of T, Algonquin. Oh, there's 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 quite a few now actually. Um, Centennial, I believe. Um, uh, Centennial, and there's Public History, Carleton, and yeah. um, London down here at Western. Yeah, so there's well, quite a few. Um, but in terms of exhibit design, um, I know people that also have an architectural background, um, mm -hmm. if you're specific to exhibition design. Uh, but for myself, I came through and within that program, they teach about exhibition design for small institutions, um, such as the institution that I work in. Um, and it all takes place in Peterborough. So they actually work with a, another, uh, with the Peterborough Museum, and the, the students actually get to do an exhibit for that site. So they get hands-on experience directly within the museum and that's really how I came about museum work and then through my role as curator again being at a small site we don't have just one person dedicated to exhibitions it is a team effort amongst myself and the other staff um, but uh, I do take the lead role in the design process um, and research and, and such but again it is a team effort so that's just a, a quick synopsis of how I kind of got into exhibit design and I have a feeling the other two panelists got in it a completely different way <laughs> And that is often the uh, yeah. uh, the case. Um, Georgiana, how did you uh, get into it? Well, uh, as Melissa said, uh, yeah, I got I got into it uh, through a very uh, different um, uh, path. So uh, it is also a matter of um, the sub the subject matter of the museum you work with. So for example, in a fine art gallery, uh, tackling uh, exhibit design is, a very, is quite different from uh, designing an exhibit in a community museum or a, a military museum or a science museum or a children's museum. But uh, what they have in common is you communicate an idea. So uh, with that in mind, uh, each and every one of these categories of, of uh, museums will, uh, will um, design their exhibits um, with, um, with a certain, um, how should I express that? Uh, their exhibits have to be designed so as to reflect the message that was uh, um, decided upon. And um, uh, myself, I can't pretend I am designing exhibits. I don't consider myself an exhibit designer. What I do, I develop the content and storyline. So uh, that means I am part of a team when whether that team is are my coworkers or uh, a company that um, we uh, contract out to help us uh, achieve the design we want. Uh, I'm still part of a team. I can't do it alone. So uh, uh, 
again, I don't consider myself an exhibit designer. I am just the um, the person who's um, dealing with uh, content development, which means uh, selection of artifact, research, storyline, and the uh, type of uh, experiences that we are proposing through that uh, said exhibit. Sounds good. Um, and Reve, um, sort of what field of study do you think is sort of what helps you get where you were? Are, are. I, I, I studied architecture, so interior design architecture. You, people usually, I find people coming from industrial design as well, <laughs> from the design field. But sometimes they're coming from an entertainment background and then they know how to stage things and then they're in the exhibit design right now. So it's really, people are having generally the team that you're working have different backgrounds and it's all it's not the designers always it's always there's a core team there's definitely a content creator and then right now our in blue rhino design in our core team there's two scientists so oh. you wouldn't imagine someone studying physics being in an yeah. design company but there are, we are like four or five people as a core team but we are changing in the each and every project to be involved new people as like knowledge keepers. If we need some like information from different content, we change the team. But the core team is two fit, two scientists, one industrial designer, one me, and then one editor. There, then there's a need for someone who can read and write things in the right way, using the language in the perfect way. So. This is the core team, but then we are changing the team for each and every project because you know you can know each and every topic well. So we are looking for knowledge keepers. Yeah, that's that's a really good idea, a good point to make is that as every all of you have discussed, is everybody is coming from a lot of different backgrounds, and it's sort of what you do with those backgrounds to sort of help um, uh, share something an exhibit like this. Um, Another question we had, um, what are some factors that you have to consider when developing, um, like when you're doing visuals for the exhibits? Um, are there any things you have to consider, like um, choices of images also with accessibility? Um, any impact on that? Um, does anybody want to start or should I keep picking? I start. Okay. So uh, when I heard the question, I automatically thought of AODA new legislation coming up uh, in January. So uh, accessibility is the first uh, thing, right? Uh, uh, you want to present a topic and uh, you have a small little photograph that you use for that, but you want that image to be illustrative of, uh, I don't know, uh, a sentence or whatever you've developed in your uh, storyline. Uh, a small little uh, photo will not be properly seen. So that's where uh, you start working with, um, with your uh, team members and uh, the designer, the graphic designer, the art designer, let's call them like that, uh, you ask for their help. And so um, that's, how, uh, um, that's how it works. Um, then uh, you want to highlight, if you want to highlight something, you will always, I feel at least myself, I need uh, the, um, uh, the designer to help me identify what's the best way to, uh, which visuals are more suitable to highlight the idea. Thank so uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of how uh, it works in my case, at least. Cool. Um, usually, when we like add, to add to Georgiana's comment, usually when we, before selecting any visuals, we decide, when we work on an exhibit, we try to settle a voice for an exhibit, like from which voice we are telling the exhibit or who's the visit, is it a young girl or is it an yeah. average? like someone who's walking from the street and coming to a museum is, 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 it of the, is it the community who is it so that we know what what is the voice of the exhibit and through that voice we look for the visuals so what could be interesting for that 
audience for that voice. So we go to that in terms of content. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Melissa, anything yeah. you'd like to add? Um, again, my first, when I think of visuals, I automatically think of accessibility right away because that's going to kind of um, create your help. You're going to consider that through all your layout, your graphic panels, your exhibit furniture, everything will be considered based on accessibility. Uh, my first line when I read this was become good friends with your graphic designer. Um, for again, small institution, that's, that's myself. Uh, that's where I really enjoy working with others as well. Um, that becomes a group effort, but um, I can't really add too much besides what, what uh, Marvary and Georgina have said is um, considering your audience is, is one of the main factors. Um, usually we have a theme based on our big idea and you're taking that theme and that's kind of incorporated into your visuals as well that helps develop your, your visuals, whether it's your, again, whether it's your graphics, um, the space itself and the layout. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of things that um, are considered when you're actually doing the, the visuals for an exhibit. Um, it, again, a team effort. Wonderful. Or yeah. simple things like copyright. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You can't just yeah. use images. No. From data. It always needs to be copyright. Yeah. And then copyright can have like costs associated with it as well. If, um, if you really want to utilize certain items. I've been fortunate in being a community, small community museum. Um, people have, um, haven't charged us for certain, um, copyright, but, but they can, it's, it's, uh, copyright is a huge thing to consider as well. Well, of course there are, uh, finance, uh, aspects to consider as well in the design work. Uh, then also it's, there is, um, uh, 2D design and 3D design, uh, bi-dimensional, three-dimensional. So uh, that's why you really work with a designer, whether they are graphic designers or uh, architects or, I don't know, furniture designers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you still have them there. You, as Mel Melissa said, there is a certain space you are working with and you have to uh, find the fine line and the right balance between uh, the idea, the uh, visitors, so the, uh, the experience, the person who uh, experiences the, uh, the exhibit and uh, your content, right? Yeah, it's a, a very important balance. Um, so we just have a few more minutes left, so I'm just gonna try and sneak in one last question um, that we had. Um, and it was, what kind of projects get your creative juices pumping and why? Um, <laughs> does anyone want to jump in on that? No, I can start actually, I don't mind. Okay. Um, so for me, I've already touched on it slightly and it involves um, working with, again, community curated exhibits. Um, I love working with our community and that comes from um, storytelling. I'm always looking at... Um, I'm inspired by the challenging way of, ways of trying to tell stories in different formats through exhibits. Um, and then again, working with the community. Um, for instance, I actually showed it in the video, The Reflections of Oshawa, which, was, which also involved our youth um, interviewing seniors. So it kind of brought in that whole multi-generational approach um, to collecting those stories, of course, with the guidance of, um, of our staff. And uh, this type of project is a little more challenging to do now because we wouldn't be able to do the face-to-face -face, um, interviews uh, with COVID. So we actually had an exhibit that was supposed to open uh, this year that we had to put off because some aspects of it couldn't be completed um, with, um, with all the COVID restrictions. And a lot of seniors aren't on Zoom. Some are, it's amazing, but because uh, we can utilize that for our, for our interview process. But uh, really that is probably what gets my juices going is working with the community um, and having them help me develop these exhibits. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, that the, it is absolutely, it is very rewarding. And uh, the, I think the best aspect of uh, exhibit work is uh, the partnerships, the teamwork. Uh, but um, my, my personal attraction is uh, uh, exhibits on controversial subjects. 
controversial mm -hmm. topics. And uh, it is because I'm a little selfish, you may say. Uh, it is because uh, as curators, we have the advantage of not commenting of the outcome of the c controversy. We just uh, <laughs> uh, state the facts. We just present the facts and then the visitor takes whatever it is to be taken from there. So uh, I, I really enjoy that position uh, as a, an exhibit developer. <laughs> Very nice. Great. I, uh... Yeah, uh, I, I once participated in a, in a panel called Curating Conflict. <laughs> and uh, it, it, is, uh, it is really uh, interesting, very interesting, challenging, but uh, also very rewarding and rich, very rich. Okay. Mm -hmm. Rebe? I think uh, what I like is if a story Mm, that's how I say it. If it's never told before, or the way, I mean, it should be something new. If if it's challenging enough, if you can't really follow the steps of a different exhibit, then it's fun. No matter what the topic is, it should be new. Like the storyline should be new, or something has to be done for for the very first time. Then it really excites me because I can't really follow anything so you go to the communities if it's the case you go to the artifacts if it's that case if you go i don't know new is exciting i can completely understand that idea every when you get something that you haven't tried before you're like this this is going to be fun i'm going to learn something today which is lovely but that is uh, basically our time up for the day um, i want to thank our panelists for joining us today thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, your experiences and helping share a little bit more about the um, exhibits end of your work. Um, we really, really appreciate you. And we also really appreciate all of the participants who showed up today to learn a little bit um, about exhibits. Um, this meeting is being recorded, so we will be releasing um, a video sometime after um, this event. So if you want to share it with anybody, um, it will be up on the Royal Canadian Regiment Museum's YouTube channel.